Okay. Now streaming so, on YouTube. I'm sorry. Maybe during the presentations, everybody else can mute their mics. Otherwise, the video will toggle around between the speakers all the time. I have a question. So we are going to read the questions that are posted before. Yeah. So we are going to actually ask them. Yes, Probably it's better. Okay, yeah. good. If you want, you can ask one quick question after each presentation, but maybe it's easier to postpone all of them at the end. Yes, I guess. It's up to you, you will see. Yeah, probably we postpone. You yeah, also, of course, moderators are, asked, are allowed and encouraged to ask their own questions. You know, just the mediator. Yuval, we have to announce that they postponed the deadline for the RAMP session, right? Uh, oh, I actually haven't to... followed that. So you can announce, please, please announce. Okay. Yeah. So are you happy how it's going so far? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah well, it uh, could, could have been much worse. And let's see, I think that uh, the main uh, challenge is still ahead of us. But so far, uh, I mean, it's a learning process also. I think that uh, overall, everybody has been very cooperative and positive. So that's good. I will start the recording now. You can begin when you're comfortable. Okay, okay maybe I will start. I will start with a quick announcement about the RAM session. So the RAM session will be on Wednesday, so tomorrow, and uh, the deadline is uh, postponed by three hours. So the deadline is at noon UTC time. Okay, and uh, I would repeat, of course, the announcement after the session. So please go, Kago. Okay, so uh, good morning, uh, Europe, and uh, hello, <laughs> the rest. So um, this is uh, second day of Eurocrypt, starting with symmetric crypt analysis, and we have uh, six talks in this session, uh, each uh, approximately five minutes, and we're going to collect all the questions and uh, um, ask them, have the discussion after the talks, and you are, uh, uh, it's, it's best if you use this uh, question and answer Q&A uh, chat for the question. And please um, also write to whom you ask the question, because as collecting, it might otherwise be complicated to get it uh, aligned with the talks. Okay, and the first talk is um, Mirdul is there and going to start with uh, mind decomposition. Okay, so can you see my slides? Yes, should I start? Hello? Yes, please start. You but you did to share so your screen far. again. Okay, okay. Okay, so, okay, so I will talk about uh, the minor composition. Basically, it's two bundle bound attacks called one 
uh, infrastructure, EW, PDMD, and HSAC 2.1. So I just uh, skip the... Uh, your the your slides are not visible. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Slides are not visible? No. Sorry. Okay, so... Oh, I'm recording. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Okay. So is it okay now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so basically, I will uh, uh, discuss the uh, situ analysis of compositions of two ideal primitives. So, when you have two primitives f and g, it can be either random permutation or random function, or uh, even it can be circuit or the public. So, what will be the security uh, picture for this type of composition? So, some of them are already known. So if you take one of them is circuit permutations. Uh, and the both are secret, then you can see, see easily uh, the kind of permutation. But there are some interesting cases. So, for example, if you take uh, two composition of two uh, ideal random functions which are same, which has been analyzed by Omic in uh, 2017, and and then that can be actually easily seen by looking at uh, the collision uh, uh, number of collisions. You will expect more collisions for the compositions of the random functions than a ideal random functions. So that's the basic idea, and it's, it's not uh, very difficult to see. Just uh, you have to do uh, that with, uh, with the computations. But the, uh, the most interesting thing is that if you see the existing construction EWCDMD, you can view this actually as a compositions of two random functions. But it's not exactly the random functions, but it will be can be viewed as a close to random functions. So you have to do a little more uh, uh, probability calculations, and you will see that uh, the previous analysis of the compositions of random function can be carried through here. So this is the very uh, trivial analysis of the EWCDMD, which was initially uh, 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 accepted in uh, crypto 17, and then later it has been uh, removed uh, uh, due to my observations. But very recently, we have another uh, uh, construction, SOKC21, whose, uh, whose analysis can be done in under this type of structures, where you have one uh, secret random permutation and you have another public random functions. So even if uh, we have this type of compositions, you can distinguish in the bound attack. Here we note that you do not expect higher collision because uh, the outer, uh, the inner layer is the secret and no permutation. So you don't get any collision in the inner layer. So the number of collisions we really expect uh, for the construction is as same as uh, the random functions. But you have a public random function, so you can exploit that. You can actually go for the matching uh, with uh, the number of uh, collisions, a number of uh, matching between the constructions and the public function now. So basically, uh, if I to guess the internal value, uh, I just show, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so basically, if you look at xi equal to z, then you know that yi will be cz, where x, uh, xi represent uh, the public function primitive queries, and z represent the internal value that you don't know. So you expect higher collision probability, because even if they don't match, there will be a collision chance. So that is the basic idea, even if you have a compositions, uh, one of them is permutations. And that actually can be applied for this SOKC21. Uh, why this is called SOKC21, you can see that in slide later maybe, but the basic idea is that if you can view this as a uh, compositions of the public random functions or uh, a composition of the secret random uh, permutations and the public random functions. So this is the picture of the SOKC21. Another way to view this, we can it's clear that this part is uh, you have a, a, a secret and permutation type construction, and later you have a, a, a public and functions, and then you can apply this uh, previous attack. So that is the basic uh, idea of the SOKC21 attacks. You can get the birthday bound attack. All these uh, constructions were claimed to have beyond birthday bound attack, so there are some fundamental flaws. So uh, I just want to conclude that okay, we have the birthday bound attack, and but the data doesn't work for you, know, you have a mask and the, at the end. So there are some variants for SOKC21 or even some variants for EWCDM. Uh, the attack doesn't work, but uh, 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 you can you can try probably you can try the have a better security or uh, you may have a, some a different type of attacks. So that's those are the open problems. And I just want to point out one important thing. So this is very important thing. Uh, I I have observed in many many days uh, that there, are, uh, there is some fundamental flaw in the review system. I I found that maybe due to the uh, time constraint or 
maybe the non American the experts that we are getting lots of lots of uh, papers which have uh, I mean having some flaws in them. So we, this is the most important open problem in the community right now. And I would try to uh, I would like to mention this particular paper by Coverage uh, and Managers, uh, which is a critical perspective on global security. So this gives a nice uh, exposure on uh, uh, on the, all these uh, typical results we have, which has some flaws or uh, uh, or, this, uh, or not correct security understanding. Okay, so I think I am done with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe you can mute your microphone. Uh, sure, yeah. No, thank you very much. And uh, as I said, we are going to take the questions uh, uh, later. So the next uh, talk is by Antonio, I think. Antonio. So I will talk about the paper, Improving the Key Recovery in Linear Attacks and Application to 28 Rounds Present by Maria Naira Plasencia and myself, Antonio Flores Gutierrez. So I, of course, I will talk about linear cryptanalysis or more specifically linear key recovery attacks. So our work builds on a paper from 2008 in which a new technique uh, to accelerate some linear key recovery attacks was described and it used the FFT. Ever since there have been several application examples of this uh, type of speed up, but there hasn't been a general study. So the motivation for our work was basically to better understand the capabilities and limitations of this type of speed up linear attacks. So in a key recovery linear attack, we have a linear approximation of a path of a block cipher. And what we want to do in matrix algorithm two is given a set of plain text cipher text pairs, we want uh, to, for all the possible guesses of a path of the key, to compute the bias of the linear approximation with the hope that if there are enough uh, available pairs, then uh, the guess which exhibits the largest bias will be the correct one. So if we implement this uh, basic version of the algorithm, the time complexity is the number of pairs n times the number of guesses for the part of the key that we guess, which is two to the number of bits you say. So in the paper from 2008, uh, they ask if we can do the computations more efficiently. And the first thing they do is place uh, all the biases or more specifically all the correlations as a vector Q. And in last round key recovery attacks, they find that uh, this vector Q is the product of a vector A, which can really quickly be obtained from the data, uh, basically uh, in as many steps as pairs. And then uh, we can multiply by a matrix C, which actually only depends on the structure of the cipher. Furthermore, this matrix C has a very specific structure and essentially uh, it has a fast multiplication algorithm which uses the fast walls transform. So this leads to another algorithm which has two steps. First, we have the uh, distillation phase which is constructing the vector A and which uh, takes essentially a big N steps. And then we have the so-called analysis phase which is multiplying by the matrix C and that has a complexity of big O of uh, the number of bits of key that uh, are guessed in the attack times two to that number of bits. And that's essentially the complexity of the walls transform. So our contribution is the following. First, we provide the new matrix description, which can describe a wider variety of attacks, in particular those which have a key recovery or multiple rounds at both the beginning and the end of the cipher. So the time complexity essentially is uh, the same for the distillation phase. And for the analysis phase, we have two to the total number of bits of key that we guess, times the number of bits that we guess in the first and last round subkeys, which I called K outer here. So uh, another advantage of this algorithm is that uh, the distillation phase is more generic. And for example, in multiple and multidimensional attacks, we only have to uh, process the data once and we can reuse the processed data for every uh, approximation. And finally, uh, we have also considered uh, the problem of what happens if the cipher has a key schedule, which induces some dependent relationships between the bits of key and how that information can be used uh, to diminish the time complexity of the attack and have provided two different techniques to this end. So on to applications and we look at uh, the block cipher present and in particular, we provide an attack on the 28 round variant of 
the cipher, which we believe is the first attacks. And as an example, we have an attack on the ATBT variant, which has two to the 64 data complexity, that is the full code book, and two to the 77.4 time complexity, which is slightly lower than exhaustive search. So uh, finally, I'd like to remark that there are many ways to improve on this work. For example, we'd like to apply it to other ciphers. We'd also like uh, to uh, develop some automatic tools, which given a particular linear approximation of a block cipher, can compute uh, the time complexity of um, linear attack using this uh, particular approximation. And finally, we think that there are some cases in which uh, some further optimization of the algorithms can be done uh, specifically cases in which the data is very sparse. So we thank you for listening and this is my presentation. Thank you very much, Antonio. So then it's uh, all next, I think. Thank you. Just a second, sharing screen. Oh, sorry. Um, yep. Okay, so this is a joint work with Nathan Keller, Noam Lasser and Adi Shamir uh, about new slide attacks on almost self-similar uh, ciphers. And a quick recap, uh, if you look at slide attacks, you have, uh, if you have a cipher such that all the rounds are the same with the same key as well, then if P is partially encrypted to Q after one round, then the encryption of Q in both sites, both encryptions is going to continue the same all the way through. And at the end, there is also going to be one round of a difference between C and the ciphertext D. Now, this is a very useful technique when the number of rounds is as, as large as you want because P and Q just encrypt all the way through till the end. Now, one problem with the slide attacks is that you need the ability to solve this sort of equation that covers two rounds, one round at the beginning and one round at the end in order to uh, break the cipher. So the slide attacks usually are working in the following manner. You find a slit pair and you use the slit pair to extract the key. It's just that in order for you to identify usually that the slit pair is indeed a correct one, you need to, uh, to be able to identify the slit pair, which is always happens after you found the right key by identifying the slit pair. And this is a bit circular argument. So there are many extensions and generalizations, a slide with a twist, advanced slides uh, using chains and slide decks and reflections, and even some results on using quantum slide attacks. Um, but there is a very uh, inherent uh, assumption underneath, which is that all the round functions are exactly the same. And this is not the case. Um, in things like AS or SP networks, because the last round either is different, because for example, in the case of AS, or because in SP networks, this is not the case. The last round has this extra key addition anyway. Otherwise, otherwise you can always uh, go backwards. So uh, because of that, you can see, um, even if you have a slid pair and you look at the ciphertext, the CND, you cannot continue their generation. They, they will not be also slit pair with respect to the next uh, encryption. And many of the cryptanalytic techniques actually rely on that fact that you can continue encrypting stuff. Um, so we introduced in this paper actually four new techniques in order to overcome the last round. The first one is slit sets instead of just generating one slit pair. So usually you do a slit pair and then if you need a chain, you, know, you do another slit pair and another slit pair. Here instead, instead of having chains, we have a bunch of slit plain text. So you take a set of plain text, a set of plain text, and if this set becomes this set, then you have many slit pairs and the analysis is very similar. We also discuss hypercube of slit pairs, which is a technique of taking two slit pairs or three slit pairs or more. In the paper, we show how to do it with five slit pairs and combine them into a hypercube of 32 slit pairs using a very simple trick. Uh, we also do other uh, two techniques. The first one is the suggestive plain text structures, where instead of just picking plain text of the first structure and the second structure, when you pick a structure, you already know something about the key. Meaning if this is a right structure, then you know something about the key. And finally, the substitution slide, which is a bit playing with algebra, which allows us to break several constructions, which we couldn't do before. Um, so very quickly, um, if before the best known results were about uh, one, KSA, or I'm not going to get now into the full definitions, you should read the paper if you haven't done so by now, um, where you can do a very uh, simple attack using one slit pair. 
when you want to attack two rounds, which repeat itself, or three rounds, you need to use other techniques. Um, and also in the case of secret S-boxes, whereas the previous results by Baron et al knew how to break uh, uh, iterated uh, constructions, like, construction like that with a single round uh, cycle, uh, in the case of an unknown S-box, actually the attack doesn't work because you cannot generate slit chains. And because you cannot generate slit chains, you couldn't break it actually. And now we know how to do it using two different techniques. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice slides. Um, so next uh, talk is by Nathan, I guess. Okay, thanks. I'll just show my screen. Okay, so so good morning. Thanks for coming to the talk. I'm presenting the paper, The Retracing Boomerang Attack, which is joint work with Ordun Kelman, Eyal Ronen, and Adi Shamir. So, uh, okay, so let's recall what is a boomerang attack. Uh, so, assume that some block cipher E has the composition as E0 e and then E1, and that we have differentials in E0 and E1. So in E0, alpha goes to beta with the probability P. In E1, gamma goes to delta with probability Q. Then the cipher E can be broken with an adaptive that shows a plaintext and cipher text attack with complexity one over P squared Q squared. How the attack works? We take a pair of plaintexts with different alpha. Then we take the cipher text T1 and T2 and shift both of them by delta. And then we decrypt them, we get two new plaintexts, P3 and P4, and we claim that the difference is alpha with probability about one over P squared Q squared. This is why it's called boomerang because it uh, goes uh, back like a boomerang. Why it works? Because if the, if the field differential for E0 works, then the difference in the middle between X1 and X2 is beta. If two differentials in the second half cipher work, then we have differences in gamma between x to x4 and x5 and x3. Then we get difference beta between x3 and x4, and we go back to difference alpha between p3 and p4. Now, what is our new idea? We suggest that if we force dependence between the pairs c1, c3, and c2, c4, then we can make the probability that both differentials for E1 work be higher than Q squared. So here we assume that we can further decompose the second half cipher into two half ciphers. And then the second half cipher works as two in parallel. Here we, we can see it in the figure. We have E0 and then E11 and E12, where E12 is further subdivided to the left part and the right part. Now we assume that we have differentials for E11 and also for E12 left and for E12 right. And then uh, the probability should be just for all the probabilities squared. But if we make sure that the difference in the left part of the cipher that is either zero or delta L, which is the output difference of the left part, then the probability will increase to uh, by a factor of one over Q to less. Okay, so this is why we call it retracing boomerang since we force the boomerang to return partially the same way it went in the forward direction. Now, how can we guarantee that this difference is either zero or delta L? So here we propose two different ways. One we call the shifting retracing boomerang. Here we just throw out most of the data. We continue only with pairs C1, C2 that satisfy the condition. So on the one hand, we, we throw out most of the data. On the other hand, uh, we get a better uh, the probability of the differential, and it helps uh, in the signal to noise ratio and in many other aspects. The other idea is what is called the mixing retracing boomerang, which can be viewed as a generalization of the yo, -yo attack. Here, we continue with all pairs C1, C2, but instead of 
shifting all of them by the same delta, we shift each of them by a different delta, which just flips the left part of each pair and leaves the right pair, uh, right part unchanged. And uh, so uh, in the left uh, side, we gain the probability of Q to left, and in the right side, we just uh, pass for free, so we gain even more in the problem. Now, something about applications. We have several applications of the technique, an attack on five round AES with overall complexity of only two to the 16. It should be mentioned that five round AES was attacked with numerous techniques in the last 20 years. Until two years ago, all attacks were stuck at uh, 2 to the 32. Uh, at uh, Crypto 18, we had an uh, attack with complexity 2, 2 to the 24. And now we get it all the way down to 2 to the 16, but actually in the more restrictive adaptive uh, chosen trading and cyclotex model, we also have an attack on 5 round AES with a secret test box with complexity of 2 to the 26. And also we can improve the data complexity of the boomerang attack on 6 round AES from 2 to the 71 to 2 to the 55. Something about the attack on 5 round AES. So if we had only four rounds, there is a euro distinguisher with, which needs only four plaintiffs, which takes two plaintiffs P1 and P2 with zero difference in the first diagonal. Then to the two corresponding cipher text, they do the, the change like we described, only changes inter, uh, interchanging the left part and uh, keeping the right part uh, the same. Well, here the left part is the first uh, uh, inverse column. And then we just check that the corresponding plain text have, are equal in the first diagonal. This should work with probability one for four round AES. So this is by Ronjom et al. Uh, for five round, what one can do, also by Ronjom et al, one takes two to the six pairs with non-zero difference only in the first diagonal. Then we denote the radius after one round by W1 and W2. And we hope that they have zero difference in the first diagonal. Then we apply to them the four round distinguisher and we get this zero difference in one byte after one round. Since this byte depends on four key, key bytes, then we can get this four key bytes and we obtain a stack in 2 to the 40 and Ronjom et al made it 2 to the 31 by several very wise tricks. So we want to improve it. So first we observe that this one byte difference, it depends on four key bytes but actually this dependence can be written as the sum of four independent functions, f1, f2, and f3, and f4, where each of them depends on the plain text and a single sub key byte. This allows us to apply a meet in the middle attack, which takes two, two such key bytes on each side, and then each application takes two to the 16. And also we can use a dissection technique, since we have here four functions, to reduce the memory complexity to two to the eight. Since we have to repeat this attack for two to the six pairs of plain text and four possible values of the byte with zero difference, since we just hope that there will be zero difference in the column after one round, then the overall complexity is two to the 24. But I promised two to the 16. How can we get two to the 16? And so here we further refine the meet in the middle procedure. And we take a specially chosen plain text pairs with difference in only two bytes zero and five. And then if we know that the difference after one round worked well, then we can have an equation involving only key byte zero and five, and then we can remove one of them, eliminate one of them from the equation. On the other side, we take two to the 14 plate experiments so that for two to the six of them, uh, we have zero difference in byte 10, so we can remove all of these bytes on the meet in the middle. Then the meet in the middle procedure is one byte from each side, so it takes about two to the eight operations. And, and so the overall complexity become, becomes two to the 16. And we fully verify this attack experimentally so that we really know that it works. Okay, so we, you can see more in the full version of the book. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. And then we have uh, Joske next.
Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so I want to talk about modeling for a three subset division property with that unknown subset. So, okay, as a topic is about cube attack and the target is a string cipher. So cube attack was originally proposed by Dinu and Shami at Eurocrypt 2009. And uh, this is target string cipher. And now X is a secret and B is a public. So attacker can control the public, the public value B. And the uh, uh, first attacker creates a cube uh, where the sum of bits of a public value is activate, active and the correct uh, such uh, ivory and correct such key stream and the sum of the key stream. So if uh, the function f is decomposed like this, so the, then uh, by summing up the key stream over the cube, this value is equal to the pi. So this polynomial is called a super poly. And if this super poly is very, very simple, so we can uh, recover the secret variable x by observing this value. But of course, if we want to attack, if, if we want to execute this attack, we first need to recover the super poly in advance. So the uh, main problem of the cube attack is how to recover the super poly. So this is a history of the cube attack. The original idea, in the original idea, the super poly is recovered experimentally. So it means that we first create a cube experimentally and uh, compute the sum and uh, observe uh, uh, recover the super poly experimentally. So in, in that case, as uh, a cube size must be practical like uh, 32. But of course, in that case, so the, it is impossible to evaluate the cube attack using a very big cube like a 2 to the 78 or 2 to the 120, for example. So if we want to evaluate uh, the cube attack, uh, uh, if we want to evaluate the security against cube attack using such large cube, we need another technique. At crypto uh, 2017, a new idea was proposed and this idea used bit-based division property instead of experimental approach. If we use it, so the complexity to recover super poly is bounded theoretically. But uh, if in this attack, there is assumption. So if this assumption doesn't hold, key recovery attack uh, will be degenerated to distinguisher. So we cannot recover any key. The attack is distinguished, becomes distinguisher. So the last agent crypt, a new idea was proposed. And this idea uses three subsets bit bit three subset division property instead of bit-based division property. So if we use it, assumption is perfectly removed, so we can recover exact super poly with practical time. However, so this idea has if so however the original algorithm was designed for a, a block, cipher, block cipher analysis, not a string cipher analysis. So if we want to of course so this algorithm Original algorithm is general, so there is a post possible. It is a possible we apply this technique to stream cipher too, but uh, it's not efficient. So as a result, they cannot recover the. They cannot get the best attack against freebium and grain like uh, so the cube or previous uh, cube attack. So our motivation is to design a new algorithm to dedicate it for three subset division property with that unknown subset. So this is a uh, variant of three subset division property, and this is a uh, for uh, this is a surely useful for the super poly recovery. So unfortunately, the time is limited, so that I cannot explain everything. So this is a high level view of the uh, our algorithm. So the if you already understand the bit uh, algorithm for bit based division property, so this view is very simple and easy to understand. But if you don't uh, understand, unfortunately, maybe it's uh, very difficult to understand only by this right. So please check uh, our video uh, talk or uh, so paper. So our new uh, modeling, so that we model the propagation for uh, L set instead of K sets. So, and the goal is also different. Previous one, the check uh, goal is to check the existence of tray, but our one, so that we check uh, the number of trays. 
So, and also modeling is uh, slightly different. So, but uh, it's a very complicated. So, that I skip this one. Okay, so that this is the result. So, result is of course important. So, I have two type results. The first one is degeneration result. So, it means uh, previous some attack doesn't work, unfortunately. So, for example, so the crypto 2018, uh, so uh, best cube attack against grain 128L was proposed, but uh, this attack is uh, distinguished. So, we cannot recover key recovery. We cannot recover the secret key. And also at crypto 2018, so the another paper. So a new type of cube attack is proposed that this idea is very interesting, but unfortunately the degree estimation has some flow. So attack doesn't work. So also we have uh, improved key recovery attack. So I have many sets of uh, improvements. So the four trivium, now we attack 842 rounds and uh, using uh, our new cube. Okay, so the, this is the conclusion. So I propose a new tool for uh, uh, super body recovery. And uh, by using this technique, so that we can lead the, lead the best key recovery attack against the well-known stream ciphers like Freebeam, Brain, Acorn, and Craigie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yosuke. So then we are at the last talk of this uh, session, which is uh, Itai. Okay, uh, hi everybody. My name is Itai and I'll be presenting uh, my paper, Tight uh, Time Space Lower Bounds for Finding Multiple Collision Pairs and Their Applications. Uh, so this uh, work is a bit different from the other works in the session in the sense that uh, I'm not going to propose any new attacks, but actually I'm going to, uh, to kind of investigate the limitations of existing attacks. Okay, so I'll start by considering a classical double encryption scheme where you encrypt the plain text by some key K1, you encrypt the result under K2 and you obtain the ciphertext. Uh, so I'll assume for simplicity that all parameters are taken from a set of uh, size N and the setting is as follows. We're given a several plain text ciphertext pairs and the goal is to recover the secret key. And the best known attack in this case is the classical meet in the middle attack which uh, gives you time of uh, roughly n. Uh, however, it requires a space of roughly n bits. So we know that memory is an expensive resource and uh, we ask what happens when uh, your memory is much smaller than n. And in this case, the best known algorithm uh, basically uses the following approach. So we focus just on P1 and C1, the first plain text ciphertext pair. And uh, we reduce the key recovery problem to uh, a collision search problem of uh, finding about n different collisions between two carefully crafted functions. F1, which works on the top half of the uh, block cipher and F2 uh, um, considers the bottom half of the block cipher. And I should mention as a remark that uh, in, at least in this attack, uh, the we, we focus on P1 and C1 and the remaining um, plain text ciphertext pairs, P2, C2 and so forth are used only for post filtering key suggestions. Okay, so uh, more formally, the collision search problem that uh, I'm going to consider is as follows. So a goal is to find about N collision pairs and in a random function or in, between two random function, it's actually kind of the same problem. Um, using a space of S bits, that's the, that's the goal. And the best known algorithm for this is a classical cryptanalytic, cryptanalytic algorithm. It's called parallel collision search, introduced in 96, and it gives you some trade-off, some time space trade-off, T squared times S equals N cubed. And uh, well, we ask ourselves, can we do better? Can we improve upon this trade-off? Um, so more specifically, can we improve uh, this uh, trade-off for uh, the collision search problem? And why is this uh, question interesting? Well, the, this question is interesting because if we can improve this trade-off, then what we get is a better time-space 
uh, trade-offs for breaking uh, double encryption, but not only double encryption, we can actually improve time-space trade-offs for various applications, such as the breaking triple and multiple encryption, uh, some dedicated meet-in-the-middle meet attack on a specific crypto system. We can uh, solve generalized birthday, the generalized birthday problem uh, more efficiently with limited space. We can solve sub subset sum problem more efficiently with limited space. So there are various uh, applications if you, if you can improve this trade-off for the collision search problem. So uh, I'll uh, uh, now uh, come to the result. So uh, the first result uh, in the paper is that actually this uh, time-space uh, trade-off for the collision pair search problem is optimal. So you cannot improve it. Um, so I don't obviously have time to uh, dis discuss the proof, but the proof basically uses uh, a classical um, uh, framework uh, developed in uh, complexity theory by uh, Borden and Cook in 82. But interestingly, this is the first time uh, it is used in the domain of uh, cryptography. Um, so the conclusion from this uh, proof is that, uh, well, the, uh, these uh, time space uh, trade off algorithms for all the applications that I uh, discussed cannot be improved by a more efficient collision search because you cannot uh, uh, find collisions more efficiently in this setting. Um, however, it uh, does not rule out the possibility that uh, uh, time space trade-off for the application can be improved by other means, just uh, not by a more efficient collision search. Um, so it would be very interesting to try to prove the optimality of these applications, the time space trade-off uh, uh, algorithms for these applications uh, that I uh, mentioned. Unfortunately, if uh, we, we would be able to, uh, to uh, prove the optimality of the time space trade off for the, the applications that I presented, then we would actually uh, overcome a long standing barrier in complexity theory. Basically, this means that it would be very, very hard uh, if we can prove the, to, to prove, to actually prove the optimality um, mm -hmm. of the time space trade offs uh, that we know for the applications. Uh, however, if you make some, uh, if you kind of uh, relax the problem a bit and make a few assumptions, and sometimes you can prove some interesting results. And this is uh, this brings me to our second result, uh, which focuses specifically on break, breaking double encryption. Uh, so what uh, I show in the paper that the current attack strategy of focusing only on the first plaintext ciphertext pairs and using the remaining plaintext ciphertext pairs for post-filtering purposes, if you, uh, if you only, uh, if you use such a text strategy, then actually you cannot improve uh, the trade-off, uh, the best known trade-off for breaking double encryption. So if you want to improve this trade-off, you some kind of have to, you, ca you have to deviate from the strategy um, of course, it could be that this uh, trade-off is still optimal, but uh, currently we don't have the, the tools in order to, uh, to, to prove this. Uh, so I think uh, that's, uh, that would be all. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, Itai. Thank you, uh, everybody. I still didn't find out how to clap, but there's some thumbs up or something, but okay. Thank you, uh, everybody, all the speakers. Um, and I think we have uh, some questions uh, to ask. There, there were also some questions um, in the Q&A, which were already answered, but we are going to repeat at least some of them so that uh, also on YouTube, they become uh, available. Okay, so uh, the first question uh, is a question from uh, Shen Yaobin to uh, Mridul. So uh, the question is, can we fix the bugs in the proof of the mirror theory uh, for NBIT security? Thank you. Uh, yes, actually, we have a proof uh, for uh, the mirror theory, the NBIT security proof of the mirror theory. Uh, but right now, the proof is uh, uh, only applied for the Zymax value is two. So there is one parameter for Zymax. Uh, the most interesting uh, application point of view would be the one you have a proof for general Zymax. So, but this is definitely the first step. So we have understood how to prove uh, for the Batman mirror theory. And there are two approaches already known uh, by the uh, by the Batarin uh, et al. Uh, we have gone through both approaches, but it looks like there is lots of 
uh, steps which are missing. So it's not clear yet that whether I will be able to complete the proof for general Zymax or not. But I, I have a hope to complete the proof for general Zymax. But uh, we have a, a clear answer for Zymax equals to two. Yeah, that's, that's what I want. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now we have another question for uh, Antonio uh, from uh, Sharfad. So the question is: um, Does uh, your attack uh, help in accelerating uh, the partitioning cryptanalysis? So uh, essentially, uh, we haven't looked at it. Uh, so I can't say anything for sure. I think it's possible, but uh, we'd have to look into it. Okay, thanks. And another question for you uh, from uh, Xiang Meng Sim. Um, so the question is basically, uh, have you considered uh, other bit-oriented block ciphers uh, like rectangle or gift? Uh, and uh, roughly, do you have an estimation of uh, what uh, the improvement factor uh, for these ciphers would be? So uh, we looked uh, very briefly at gift. Uh, and it's a bit different from present because in present there are many linear approximations which we can use with uh, similar uh, correlations. So essentially uh, an attack is limited by the amount of uh, linear approximations that we can afford. And in GIFT uh, it's not so clear, uh, we'd have to look further into it. Okay. And... Um... Again, another question for you. Um, so could you please uh, explain more um, how uh, to expand your model to multiple linear cryptanalysis? So uh, there are several points in which uh, this model works a bit better with multiple and multidimensional linear attacks. Uh, so for example, as I said, uh, we can reuse uh, the distilled data for several approximations or for all of them because uh, the distillation doesn't depend on the approximation. And then, uh, in fact, there is one of the techniques for exploiting the key schedule, which only works for multiple linear attacks. OK, thank you. Um, so now we have some, also some questions for Yosuke. Um, so one is from Alexei Udovenko. Uh, so if you prove that, for example, K1 is not a super poly, and you don't know about uh, the product K and K1 times K2 or any other multiple of it, uh, so for those, you would first need to apply the division property with the unknown subset to get a degree bound to remove large monomial classes. Is that correct? So the answer is no. So because uh, we don't need to use a uh, bit-based division property with are no subset. So uh, I'm sorry so that I can't explain so that everything uh, by my short talk. So please uh, check uh, uh, my uh, video talk. So I already explained uh, this technique so that actually, so that as a question set, so that if even if we, just, we know K1 is not involved, there is a possibility K1, K2 is involved. But uh, so the the modeling for a three subset division property with that unknown subset is also different for K1 or K1, K2. So by only by calling one MIRP code, we can detect everything. Uh, so the K1 is not involved, but K1, is K K1, K2 is involved. So that in such case, uh, we can uh, detect uh, such case only by one calling MIRP code. Okay, thank you. So there are other questions for you. Uh, so one from CY Sun. Uh, so how do you deal with the key schedule algorithm when this technique is applied to block ciphers? So do you treat the key schedule the same way as the encryption data path? Or, uh, and does the solver uh, terminate, say, in reasonable time? Uh, first, so, sorry, so I can't explain. Uh, I can't answer by uh, type. Because uh, limited, so the, uh, our talk is the last slide, so that it's a bit diff difficult to explain by uh, chat. So the answer is 
Actually, this is a very nice question. So applying block cipher is, uh, of course, a challenging task. But I think uh, that block cipher, block cipher or stream cipher doesn't matter. So for example, so the, uh, the Katan or Katan sounds so like uh, it's a block cipher. But I think uh, if uh, the application is this type cipher, it's a feasible. Because uh, so I think the most important part is uh, so the how many bits is updated by each round. So stream uh, three beam or grain, so the only a few bits, one bit or two bits or three bits are updated by each round. But uh, so the and cutdown or is also like this. It's a block cipher, but only one bit or two bit is uh, so updated. But uh, if for example present, so all sixty four bits are updated by uh, in each round function. I think in that case, it's a bit difficult, but of course it's a challenging task and it's an open question. Thank you. And I think it's the uh, last for you, question for you, uh, which is again from Alexey Udovenko. Uh, so have you encountered wrong outputs by Gurobi and do you think it's really reliable enough? Or are there any other optimizers that manage with the division property models uh, quite well? Uh, the answer, uh, I, ha I have, <laughs> I have, answers I have. So, uh, of course, the model is uh, very complicated and uh, so the very diff difficult and uh, so the once uh, the two solving this model is very uh, long time, there is a possibility as a solution answer is long with a something error message. So the in FM videos groby. So, I become, so if uh, the problem is very, very big and it's very, very difficult to solve it, so I recommend we should use some solvers. For example, we first try Groby and also we try SAT and we also try, for example, CPREX for another MILP solver. So I think, I'm not sure, so the because I I'm not the expert about uh, so the MIRP, uh, MIRP problem, but I recommend uh, so that it's a more uh, more good of course to check uh, so several type of uh, solver and several type of modeling and check uh, that all results is the same. It's a I think it's more better. Uh, thank you, Yusuke. So now we have questions also for R. Um, so questions from Asen. Uh, so uh, first question about run constants. Uh, what would be your recommendation uh, for your attacks uh, not to work? For example, lack of periodicity in run constant, is it sufficient? Or are there other requirements? So it's a good start having round constants which are not uh, part of a period. But you also have to make sure that you don't have uh, round constants with structure. Uh, there are several attacks based on that. For example, the self-similarity attacks on Ketchak we had in FSE 2012, and also a paper with Gaëtan and Charles and Pierre Alain from FSE 2010, where we have a generalized complementation properties which are based on using structures inside the constants against the Zamda. Thank you. So another question is, uh, would time or data complexity of the attack uh, change and how um, if uh, you do not XOR the constants, but uh, you add them modulo uh, 2 to the 8 or 2 to, 2 to the 32, for example, uh, if you use this kind of additions to, to add constants, uh, would uh, the complexity of the attack change? So. I assume we were discussing the key because if it's adding constants again, once you have constants which throughout mitigate slide attacks, then we're done. But if it's adding the key, then it shouldn't change most of the attacks. As far as I remember, we never use something which is uh, relevant to X source, but maybe Nathan can uh, uh, answer that as well. Nathan? Or I share the question was about constant, and then uh, there is, of course, no difference between whether they are uh, XOD or added. I think that if we are speaking about key addition, I would be more cautious because uh, 
we have in some of our techniques, we have a, a pairs of equations, and then if, the, if there is key addition, then the equations may not cancel out. Uh, one can mention the attacks on the even or two uh, crypto system with addition instead of fake. So in, in that case, if you simply take the slide attacks and against seven or two, they do not work, but one can uh, uh, have some variant which will work with addition uh, instead of so. I guess that this is the case also here, but one has to check it carefully. Thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, the uh, um, last question from Asen is, um, uh, is it possible to combine um, the, uh, the slide attacks with other kinds of attacks, for example, related key attacks? So the answer is yes, because first of all, slide attack is a related key attack when the key is its own self similar. So it's a, it's a variant of related key. Um, Precisely, yes, there are several works. For example, the attack on FF3 was using a related tweak slide attack. So you generated the slide by using a related tweaks, and there are several other works combining them. And also for you, uh, or we have a question for, uh, again, Alexei Yudovenko. So uh, the last linear layer can be uh, fixed uh, without the knowledge of the key. Uh, uh, though the subkey is, is then changed, uh, and is, it, is the different last subkey a big difficulty for slide attacks? So the answer is that uh, in, in, it looks like it's usually not the case, but actually in some cases there are. Nathan even gave a, a very explicit and nice uh, example of it, um, especially when, when you need the to rely on the relations between the keys at the beginning at the end, the transformation of the last round key addition actually impacts some of the attacks. For example, in the case of the substitution slide attack, it's going to have some impact. Again, maybe Nathan wants to, to explain his example. Okay, so, so I, I gave really a simple example. Consider, uh, consider the AES. And uh, let us change the round constants so that all of them are equal. So clearly there is a slide attack with a slice of uh, one round, but a standard slide attack takes 64-bit uh, data and 128-bit time. Now, if uh, the last round has the mixed columns operation, then it's very simple to make also the time complexity to the 64 because you just uh, uh, can construct some simple equation so that everything can be checked at once in a, in a single hash table. So here's the idea that we can save in the time complexity by checking all candidate slip pairs at once. Now, when the last round is different, like there is no mixed columns operation, then this doesn't work. The check of each uh, slide slip, candidate slip pair separately takes exactly the same time because as uh, Alexei said, we can uh, remove the last, uh, the last, uh, fix the last round. But if we want to check all of them at once, then this doesn't work, and the simple attack takes 228 time. In our paper, we do present an attack which takes 264, but it is much more complex. Okay, thank you. So uh, finally, we have a few questions for Itai. So a question from uh, Wang Maoning. Uh, yesterday, there was a paper uh, entitled Low Weight Discrete Logarithms and Subset Sum in 2 to the 0.65n with polynomial memory. So, maybe uh, the question is maybe your method and that one can be combined to get an improvement. So, in the paper, I'm actually not proposing new attack techniques. So, uh, yeah, obviously, I mean, I, I don't see how the what I show in the paper. Uh, can improve some attacks. Uh, what uh, you can uh, derive maybe from the paper is that the current approach that they're using is in a sense uh, not going to lead to better attacks. So maybe it would give you a hint on what you should do if you want to improve the attacks. But uh, um, I'm not proposing new attack techniques, so uh, it's not clear how we, uh, from this work you would get an improvement of, uh, of their attacks, at least not directly. 
Thanks. And finally, a question from Aishwarya Tiruven Gadam to you, Itai. So, uh, have you tried applying the post filtering model uh, to other applications uh, besides uh, double encryption? Uh, so I thought about it a bit. It's an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I think, uh, like a few interesting uh, thing to investigate for future work. Uh, I thought a bit about it a bit for triple encryption, and I think it's feasible. But uh, for example, to prove that the best known time space trade off for triple encryption are uh, are optimal, if you and still the like the best known attacks. Uh, are still uh, kind of use this post filtering approach. And I think uh, it would be feasible uh, to use similar techniques to prove that uh, this approach would not give you a better uh, time space trade off for triple encryption. However, I think that there are some uh, complications that you, you would need to overcome in order to, to actually show this. So it's, uh, it seems more difficult to analyze than double encryption. But I, I still think it's, uh, it, it, it would be possible. And this is just for the case of triple encryption. There are, of course, you can think of uh, applying similar ideas to other schemes, more general mo uh, multiple encryption schemes and, and additional problems. And I think uh, at least in some of them, there is a kind of uh, hope to, to, to actually show that the current attack strategies are not going to, to, to give you an improvement. But as I said, uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, future work uh, item. Okay, uh, thank you, Itai. So I think uh, we have no more questions on the on the Q and A uh, platform. So uh, let's thank uh, all the speakers of the session again, and I think it's right end this uh, this session. Thank you. Just before leaving, uh, I would like to remind you that the submission deadline has been extended by three hours. So the submission deadline, sorry, for the REM session. So the, the new submission deadline is at noon, which means uh, four hours uh, in four hours from, from now. So please submit your best REM session talks. Thanks to all of you. And we reconvene at uh, one. Uh... PM uh, UTC for quantum cryptography. Thanks everyone. It was a very lively session with many Q and A. So that's great. Bye now. Bye everyone.